to prepare our hearts to worship God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We come into this place this morning, we come into the presence of the Lord because we seek mercy from our gracious God. We come because we put our hopes in Him. And we come grateful that the Lord is rich in mercy and that He is faithful and it is good and right for us to trust Him and to put our hopes in Him. We come this morning to worship. We will also gather at the Lord's table as a part of our worship service this morning. Um, this is a Lenten service of worship, and during Lent, our worship service, uh, our, our order is just a little bit different, and you will follow along. Uh, there is a, a time of, uh, of singing, praising God through singing, and the, and the intent of this block of, of songs and psalms is to 
have an uninterrupted time of uh, turning our attention to the Lord with minimal other um, transitions going on in the service. So uh, usually uh, three songs together or a, a, a psalm sometimes being put in there. Uh, but it, it's intended to help us to, to center our attention on the Lord. You will notice there's an asterisk by each of those hymns. I encourage you to stand, um, but I do have sometimes people that say, I can't stand that long, and I'm going to say, that's fine, don't. <laughs> you could sit down if you need to. Um, but in that extended time of, uh, of worship, do uh, make use of that uh, opportunity to to uh, turn your focus on the Lord. We are so easily distracted. So we are grateful for these Lenten worship services that pull us back into relationship with the God who loves us. Um, just a few other announcements. Uh, Sherry, if you'll come, Sherry has an invitation for us. And uh, while she is coming, I will just remind you uh, Carol, our church secretary, is always good to put this in the bulletin. Sunday is when we have to move our clocks forward, remember? And this is the bad one. This is the one where we get an hour less sleep instead of an hour more. So prepare for that um, and, uh, and come and uh, worship and uh, uh, we'll be ready next week one, one hour later, one hour earlier than you might expect. Uh, Sherry. Good morning. Uh, as a member of the vision team, I just want to uh, remind everyone that we're working on the 50 Days to Vitality, I'm, and I want to encourage you to keep, keep plugging away at it. We're almost halfway through our book of uh, daily scripture reading and prayers, and it's really encouraging to me to know that we're all on the same page every day you know, praying for our church. So um, after service today, please come downstairs uh, to Fellowship Hall, and we'll have coffee and goodies to eat and, and discuss this uh, our latest week's uh, readings and, and whatever is on everyone's hearts to speak about. Thank you. Just a couple of prayer list updates. If you could please add Alan Dreyer, that is uh, the husband of uh, Neil's granddaughter. Um, Alan has been fighting a battle with cancer for some time and he's going to have surgery for lung cancer this week. So if you could add Alan to your list, we will add him to the print list for next week. But uh, if you'll be praying for him and I just heard uh, from Judy PC that their grandnephew Jody, uh, who's been through quite a battle and was in intensive care for a long time and went home, has now had to go back into intensive care, has uh, uh, still um, really battling with the, with the breathing. He has so many issues. If you, if you uh, w want something to pray about, ask Judy to talk to you about the life that this, uh, this uh, boy uh, is battling right now. Um, he needs our prayers. So if you would continue to pray for him as well as the others on our prayer list, I would be grateful. During the weeks of Lent, our prayer begins with confession. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles and let us together um, confess our sins. Join with me in the prayer of confession, please. Heavenly Father, you are holy and righteous, and you have shown us steadfast love. You lead us in good ways, but we have broken your commandments. We fail to love you with all that we are, or to love our neighbors as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Forgive our sins and restore us to fellowship with you and others. Help us to reflect your love in all that we do and say. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. 
Let us keep a moment of silence and offer to God our individual prayers of confession. The Lord gives us this promise in his word. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven.
could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord of kindness he ravished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more As we come to you to receive the food of your holy word, take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the Teach us. 
us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let your truth prevail over Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises, and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Please be seated. This morning's scripture reading is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, which can be found in the Pew Bible on page 192. Throughout Deuteronomy, Moses is addressing the Israelites on the plains of Moab as they are preparing to enter the promised land of Israel. In this morning's reading, Moses recounts much of the law he first introduced to the people at Mount Sinai. This reading provides the Israelites with the unmistakable call to commit themselves to the Lord and his law with their whole being. Listen with me as I read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Question 10 in the New City Catechism says, what does God require in the fourth and fifth commandments? Fourth, that on the Sabbath day we spend time in public 
and private worship of God, rest from routine employment, serve the Lord and others, and so anticipate the eternal Sabbath. Fifth, that we love and honor our father and our mother, submitting to their godly discipline and direction. Will the children come forward and join Pastor up in the front for the children's sermon? Thank you. Come on down, have a seat. I'm always so glad to see you guys. Anybody want to guess what I've got in my bag today? How could you guess? It could be almost anything small enough to fit in this bag. What do I have? It is a football. What do you do with a football? You play football. Isn't that a great thing to do with a football? It doesn't work very well for playing baseball or basketball, but it works great for football. Okay. Now, have you ever noticed that football has lots of rules? Why are the rules important in football or any other game? Nobody gets hurt. What else? Yeah, yeah, somebody does a wrong thing, like if somebody um, tries to hurt somebody, then they're going to get a penalty, right? They're, they're going to get penalized for that. Or if they're, if they're breaking a rule, say they tackle somebody when they're not supposed to, then, then they're going to get a penalty, that kind of thing. There are all kinds of rules in football and I can't figure some of them out but but the players know them and they have they have uh, uh, referees on the field too don't they guys with whistles that can blow the whistle and tell them to stop because they've got to do something different you know we need rules too we talked about this in our class a little bit we've been talking about the rules that God has given to us uh, one some of the rules that God gives to us are in the Ten Commandments. And we've been working through the Ten Commandments in church and, and in our uh, catechism class. Jesus gave two commands. Somebody asked him, what's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus said, do you know what the first one was? Anybody want to guess? Yes. Okay. Okay. No, what Jesus said is, the, this is the first commandment, love God. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God. That's the first commandment. And he was just, he was just quoting from the Old Testament. Our elder, Mr. Schultz, he was reading from that passage from Deuteronomy just a moment ago when God was telling the people that. So Jesus said, Two commandments. The first is love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love God. And what do you think the second commandment is that he said? There's two. What, love God and, and love others. Love God and love others. He said love your neighbor as yourself. And just like we need rules if we're going to play the game of football right and, and keep people safe and uh, have fun. Uh, so if we're going to be happy and if we're going to live right and treat each other well and do what is good, then we follow rules. And there are lots of rules, lots of rules in the Bible, just uh, like there's lots of rules in football. There's 10 big ones that we talk about in the Ten Commandments, and Jesus boiled them down to just two. Love God, love each other. Let's pray. Dear God, you love us. You love us so well. Uh, you show us just how much you love us in Jesus who came to die for us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us all the time. And Lord, you want us to be happy and safe and healthy. And that's why you give us rules. And you've given us these two big rules. Lord, 
Help us to love you. And not to love you just a little bit, but to love you fully. And Lord, you also teach us to love each other, to love others, to love our neighbors, those around us. And so, Lord, help us to do that. It's not always easy. Forgive us when we don't do a very good job of it. And Lord, thank you that you keep on loving us and help us to love you and others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Good to see you. Look forward to having you in class later, too. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Our text for this morning is Matthew 22 verses 34 through 40. Let's pray. Well, Lord our God, you know that... Uh, it's really easy for us to think that we know what is best for ourselves. And we don't always like living by the rules of other people. And sometimes, Lord, we find it even hard to, to want to follow your rules, your laws. And yet, Lord, we do know that you love us and that you give us your laws for good reasons. So help us, Lord, to trust you and to be open to receive what you have for us in your word because your word will help us grow. Your word will help us to be vital and healthy. Your laws will help us to conduct our lives in such a way that we will find the joy and happiness you, you intend for us. So Lord, we come before you and we trust in you and we trust that you will speak to us clearly and that you will plant your word deep within us. Speak your word, Lord, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text is Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 34. Hear the word of God. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Gentlemen, this is a football. Vince Lombardi famously began the first team meeting one season with those oft-quoted words. Now, I'm fully aware that I'm in Chicago Bear territory, but you got to admit, that's a pretty good line. <clears throat> Gentlemen, this is a football. The point is the need, always, to get back to basics. 
no matter how professional a team might be, no matter how accomplished or developed we might become, it is still important for us to remember the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals of the Christian life? What are those most basic foundations of living as followers of Jesus? How would you answer the question that the lawyers asked Jesus? What's, what's the greatest commandment? How would you answer that? Well, wrestling that with that question makes us think about what's important. What are our priorities? What are our values? What's our vision? What is our purpose? And that's a question people would often ask religious leaders and teachers. That was kind of a way to getting at what makes you different? What makes you special? What sets you apart from other teachers? What's your... What's your uh, favorite thing about the law or what what what's your priority or your major theme as you teach God's word the Lord's answer is wonderfully clear and concise love God and love your neighbor that is fundamental that's the equivalent of this is a football this is what the Lord's com Lord commands. Love God and love your neighbor. No Christian can be mature, and no congregation can be mature or vital or healthy and faithful if it drops the ball here. Now, there are hundreds of commands in the Bible. It's hard to remember them all. And we have the, the Big Ten, the commandments inscribed on tablets of stone by the finger of God Almighty himself. Those have to be important, right? They are so important that God would write them in stone. Are they written in your hearts? Do you know them? I'm not going to take the time this morning. I often do this to people. Take out a piece of paper, number it one to ten. List the Ten Commandments. How many do you think you could get? I'm not going to make you do that this week. I'm, I might next week. Jesus gives us two. He knows we're not very good at memorizing, I think. Jesus gives us two. That's easy to remember. Two easy to remember commandments. Is he ignoring the others? No, he's not, is he? He's summarizing them all. He is summarizing them all under two main commandments. And he says on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets, all the other commandments are derived from these two. Just two. But, much easier said than done, right? It is easier to recognize a football than it is to become a championship team. Love God. That's fundamental. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Don't get hung up necessarily on the different categories. It's a stand-in for every part of your being. In every way, in every area of our lives, in every facet of our being, we are to love God and to love God fully and foremost. To love God means devotion and worship and adoration, but it's more than a feeling, isn't it? In fact, uh, when, when Bill was reading from this, this incredibly important passage, oh, I, I love this passage, the, the Jews had a name for it. That, that passage was called the Great Shema. 
Shema is the Hebrew word for hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. You talk about them all day. You write them. You write them on, on your hand. You, you write them and you stick them on your forehead right in between your eyes. You write them and you put them on the doorway so every time you come and you go, you're thinking about the law of God. And what is that law? Love God with all that you are. And it's given in the midst of laws. He's just r reminded people of the Ten Commandments. And he says, this is how you love God. To love God is to honor him with all that we think and do and say. We love God with our minds. I think that's important. I uh, spoke a few weeks ago on, on Romans 12 about that passage, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewal of your minds. The mind is so important, and especially now, brothers and sisters, because our minds are crammed full with an impossible amount of information and an overwhelming number of messages. And God gets lost in the jumble of our thinking unless we love God with all our minds. Thinking on God's word, reading it, meditating on it, on God's word and biblical teaching, I think it's more important than ever because thoughts of God are more easily driven out by the noise of modern living. We love God with our bodies, with our strength, with what we eat, how we manage our passions, how we spend our personal energy. That's limited, right? We can't do everything. We wear out, tire out. So what's going to be most important? That's a way of loving God. In the great commandment, Jesus summarizes the ten. How do we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind? By worshiping God alone and not putting anything or anyone else in his place. By worshiping God as he is instead of making idols that only tame him and fashion him according to our own wishes. We love God by using his name properly and not flippantly upholding God's reputation in our conduct and conversations. Our catechism question today talked about the fourth and fifth commandments. We, we love God by keeping the Sabbath, worshiping on the Lord's day. No, golf is not a substitute. And neither is football. Lombardi did not say, gentlemen, this is God. Although a lot of people think it to be so. We love God by honoring our parents and all those whom God has put into positions of authority. He's put, us in, put them into the world to help us, to guide us, to discipline us, to teach us. And when we, teach, when we trust and follow our parents well, we are learning to trust and to follow our Heavenly Father well. So love God with all that you have with all that you are in every sphere of your life. That's first. That's fundamental. And that's why some people have provocatively said, love God and do whatever you want. Meaning, if you genuinely love God fully, to the utmost in every area of your life, then the other things that you do will be in conformity 
with all of his laws. It is first. The second, though, is like it. And like it in that it is also fundamental. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And again, the Bible shows us that love is more than emotional affection. It is action. It is doing things, and it is doing things for the good of another. It may not always be what that person asks us to do. Sometimes it's what we believe to be God's best for that person. We don't always ask for the things that we most need. And we need to love each other wisely as well. God knows what is needed. God knows we need to love one another. And that love is active. And that love may cost us something. It is Christ-like. It's sacrificial. It's genuine. It's consistent. It's all those things described in 1 Corinthians 13. Remember? Patient, kind, not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. Importantly, rejoicing in the truth and not in wrongdoing. Love is hard. It's so easy to fall in love, so the song goes. It's pretty easy to love people we like. It's a little easy to love people in the abstract. It's not so easy to love our neighbor. Because that's real, that's specific. You don't get to choose your neighbor, but you have to love your neighbor anyway. Remember, Jesus was famously asked, who is my neighbor? Oh, isn't that question of Jesus just dripping with defensiveness? Okay, sure, well, who is my neighbor? There must be some reasonable ex ex uh, uh, exceptions. You don't know my neighbor, Jesus. Or some legitimate loopholes. But the Lord cuts through all that with, a, with the penetrating parable of the Good Samaritan. And remembering that the Samaritans and the Jews did not like each other one bit. But only one neighbor is really loving and showing mercy to another neighbor. And it's the Samaritan. One neighbor who sees what is needed and helps. Even when that neighbor might despise us, or frankly, on some level, we might despise them. So, the second part of the great commandment is just as hard as the first. It's easy to remember. It's easier to remember two than ten. But it's not any easier to do them. Not only are we to love God fully in every sphere of our lives, we are to do good to those that God has placed around us, no matter who they are, what they look like, or what feelings we might have toward them. Last week, Kathleen and I saw the movie uh, Jesus Revolution. Have any of you seen it yet? It's good. You should see it. It's a good movie. It's a good telling of a true story, uh, there are many lines in the story, but at least one that means something to us, it's, it's about an old traditional declining church in Southern California. And in the late 60s, they found a way of reaching the rising hippie culture who was looking, who were looking for something to believe in. They were able to cross a 
pretty sizable cultural divide without compromising God's truth in order to love others. The most loving thing we can do is share the good news of Jesus. We resist the pressure to simply live and let live. That is no rules. Human beings are designed by God to find life and joy and purpose and contentment by living in God's ways. Jesus is the way to peace, forgiveness, truth, and eternal life. We speak that truth in love to others. Pleasing people is not the same as loving them. And again, this commandment is shorthand for the last five of the Big Ten, right? How do we love our neighbors? Well, not murdering them is a pretty low threshold, right? By safeguarding their lives as sacred. By respecting and honoring and upholding their marriages. By respecting their property, property and refusing to steal from others. By telling the truth and upholding justice and what is right by putting away coveting and envying other people for what they have. I was in a seminar Thursday evening talking about the challenges facing the church today. And Trevin Wax said that the uh, prevailing worldview has this version of the great commandment. The first is be yourself. And the second is affirm your neighbor in whatever they choose to be. That is the commandment, the great commandment by which so many people are trying to live. Be yourself and affirm what your neighbor chooses to be. But living by that great commandment is not helping us to play the game of life well. It has not made people happy or content. Loneliness and depression and disillusionment is widespread. It's not who we are made to be. Like the hippies in the 60s, people are looking for something real to believe in. And their great commandment is not doing it. We have a better. We have good news to share. Jesus gave his life to pay for our sins. He rose again to defeat sin and death. He will forgive us and restore us, heal our brokenness as we turn from our sin and follow him in faith. So what is the great commandment asking of us? In what areas have we pushed God out of the center? Are we loving him with our bodies? Are we filling our minds regularly with God-honoring content? Are we loving our neighbors enough to care about their struggles and share the love and good news of Jesus? Are we loving our one, prayerfully preparing for that moment when we could turn a conversation in a spiritual direction? Let's get back to the basics. This is a football. And this is Jesus' fundamental command. Love God and 
love your neighbor. Oh, Lord our God, you love us so well. We are humbled. We are awed at the depth of your love for us. Teach us, Lord, how to love. Teach us how to love you with all that we are and our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to care about them, their needs, their souls, as you do. And Lord, help us to trust you and follow you, for your commandments lead the way into joy and peace. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. This is not just food. This is fellowship with God that he offers us at his table. It is a sign of our belonging to Christ. And Jesus Christ himself invites all who believe to come and to have fellowship with him here at this table and always until we celebrate it with him in heaven. So this invitation is not from me, it is not from this church, it is from Jesus himself to all who believe. The Bible warns us not to eat and drink in unbelief. But if you have placed your trust 
in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. This table is for you. And it is a place for you to come and to receive strength and joy and peace from the hand of the Lord outstretched to you. Now may the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. O Lord our God, it is right to thank you and to praise you. You are our God. You are our maker. You are our savior. You are the one who made us. You breathed life into us. You fashioned us from the dust. And you made us, O Lord, as people who were designed to live in relationship with you, to follow in your ways, to know your presence. And Lord, we went away from your presence and we wandered from your ways. But you did not stop loving us. And in your mercy, you sent Jesus, your own son, who took on human flesh. And he came and he lived your ways in a perfectly righteous life. And he died as that righteous, innocent sacrifice to die in our place on the cross for our sins. And Father, you raised him again from the grave on the third day in victory over sin and death, so that not only would sin and death be unable to hold Jesus, they can't hold us either. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And thank you that as we trust in you, we are raised to new life and that we will be with you and all your people forever. Until that day, O oh Lord, we praise you and we worship you, we follow you, and we trust in you and we love you, and in faith we come and we pour out our hearts to you. Lord, we plead for our daily bread. We pray, plead for our needs. Wash us clean, O oh Lord. Renew our strength. Heal our bodies. Draw near to those who are in pain or facing surgeries or recovering. Lord, we lift up to you Alan and his surgery and Jody and his setback and Ken and his possible surgery. Lord, send your comfort upon all those who are mourning. Grant strength to those who are facing hard trials and discouragement and difficult decisions depression, who are lonely, who are afraid, so many people looking, O oh Lord, for something or someone to believe in, something that is real, something that is true. And you are real. You are truth. You are way. You are life. Lord, be with our congregation as we're going through this 50 days to vitality. And Lord, fill us with your strength that we might love you fully and love our neighbors well. Renew our congregation. Renew our vision and our mission to be on mission for you in this world where you have placed us. And now, Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon these elements. Feed us with the bread of life that we might live and believe. Lead us in revival and reformation. Make us one in Christ and may all glory and honor be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. We remember how the Lord Jesus, uh, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise which is poured out in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again.
I invite you to take the bread. Remember, Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. And now take the cup of promise and to remember, this is the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. O Lord our God, as you have met with us here, be with us always until we feast with you in the kingdom of heaven. Fill us with your joy and send us out into the world as your servants that we might love you and love our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.